Good morning. My name's Todd, I'm one of the pastors here at Ankeny Free Church, and I want to say hello to those online as well. I want to wish you all a welcome. If you're a visitor or a guest, um, we're especially glad to have you with us. We want to point out there's some ways to connect with us. You can use these nice little connection cards, which would be in the seat in front of you, unless you sit on the front row. Don't know what to say. I guess you can grab one of these. Or our ankinyconnect.com online. You can even do that as you're sitting there in your seats as well. If there's anything we can get back to you, prayer requests, needs, you want to connect, you want to serve, um, that is how you do it. Um, would love to be able to get together with you. I did want to mention that there in the back by each door, there are places if you brought an offering and it's either cash or a check and you wanted to put it in, you can simply put it in those boxes. You can put your, your card in those boxes as well. If there's any prayer requests, it can all just go into those boxes. So we're glad to have you here with us this morning. Before I begin, Our message, there's a couple things I wanted to announce. First of all is Hunter and Bree Thorpe. They had their baby, Baby Knox. And so, yes, very excited about that. They are actually home, baby and mom and everybody. They're doing great. And so, praise God for that. We kind of had a series of babies come along here recently. And it's, uh, it's neat to see that everyone's doing well. Second thing I wanted to point out is Mickey Kinzenbaugh. And I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we'll see. Mickey Kinzenbaugh is um, president of AgriHope, and he's going to be going to Zambia. And I just want to give Mickey a chance to share here because we want to pray for the trip that you're doing there. So, yeah, Mickey. Am I on? Maybe? Yeah, you're on. Good enough. Okay. Good morning. Uh, so I will actually be going to Zambia in, in uh, about two weeks. They've opened up the borders again, sort of, hopefully. So... Uh, hopefully I wind up in a, we'll wind up in a hotel for two weeks there instead of out in the field. But uh, so yeah, I run AgriHope. We've got um, four full-time and one part-time trainer in three, four different African countries now. Um, so AgriHope is a development and discipleship organization. We're an organization on mission to extend uh, a message of developing for the lives of farmers, their farms in Africa, and discipling them, bringing them closer to God. Uh, There are, I was pulling up uh, statistics this morning, Uh, there are about 1.3 billion people on the continent of Africa, of which about 60% do farming, so it's a fairly relevant uh, topic to do discipleship on. Uh, So we, uh, I was, when I was doing I forgot what the statistics were for population, and they changed from time to time. So I was pulling up, you know, how many people farm in Africa, and it's still about 60%. There's a whole lot of solutions out there. Like, everybody acknowledges the problem of, you know, a l- untapped potential that exists on the continent for farming. And I scrolled through, there were probably three different organizations doing, you know, having all sorts of investment opportunities for, you know, the continent needs irrigation, the continent needs uh, infrastructure and all these kinds of things. And the reality of it is, and I I could talk to you in length about this after the service if you guys are interested, but the reality is people need to turn to God and to do farming well. And there are some very simple things that we can do and simple things that we teach. We use a resource called Farming God's Way. We do discipleship, we get people to turn to God, and we get them to farm well with what they have in their hands. Uh, Their one to five acre plot of land that they farm on, uh, we teach them to uh, manage their uh, farm well, plant in straight lines, plant on time, plant to high standards. We teach them to don't burn, don't plow, rotate your crops. Uh, and uh, use chaff to uh, cover your ground to manage the moisture. It's real simple tech. There's no investment. There's no handouts. There's nothing that um, <clears throat> we bring to them. We teach them to use what they have in their hand with what God's given them, and uh, we've seen a lot of success with it. We've seen people have 20-fold increases uh, in their farm uh, from starting Farming God's Way um, in the matter of a year to three years. So it's a pretty tremendous amount of uptick that you can see in uh, the way that people do the way that people do farming. A lot of untapped potential out there and a lot of crazy and real high-tech answers out there, but the reality is turn to God and manage what you have well, and you can make a massive impact, and so that's what we're doing. That's great. That's great. Well, Mickey, we want to pray for you. 
Um, so I know Mickey. And uh, if forced to deny Christ or lose his arm, he would gladly get it chopped off. But, but are you willing to be unnecessarily quarantined for two weeks? That may be kind of the bigger issue. No. So, <laughs> We're going to pray for Mickey. He's also bringing a lot of tech over there. There's some um, facility stuff that you're going to be investigating. It's really been an answer to prayer, and uh, we just really want this, uh, we want this trip to go smoothly. And so if you would, bow with me. We're going to pray for Mickey here. Father, we just thank you for the work that you've done through AgriHope and in the lives of, of men and women as they, as they turn to you and realize that indeed, O oh Lord, you are faithful. And through this, we have true brothers and sisters in Christ that, that we, we, we link arm in arm with in order to see you exalted both in the U.S. and on the African continent. And so, Lord, I just thank you for Mickey. Thank you for AgriHope. Thank you for what you're doing through there. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that this would be a trip that is smooth, that it doesn't result in um, an unusual type of insta-quarantine or stuff gets taken at the border or lost or damaged, uh, that there wouldn't be issues as he travels throughout. But instead, O oh Lord, it would be life-giving and encouraging that he'd be able to, to speak into the, the people that are there serving you and to be able to see your great name be exalted on this earth. And so we thank you for that. Thank you for Mickey. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. All right. That's a, if you ever get a chance, every now and again, Mickey does a presentation on AgriHope. Here's my history with AgriHope was, has been, so I heard Mickey did this thing. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I read the book and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is really cool. And then we went to Africa, we went to Kenya and actually saw it. And it was like, this is amazing. We need a farming God's way for every industry in the world. You need to do this in your jobs. Have this sort of dependence and God-centered focus as you work in this. It was, it's, it's phenomenal. So I can't speak highly enough about it. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 17, we're in the middle of a series here in the book of John, John chapter 17, uh, talking about discipling as Jesus discipled. So as we come up today, I don't know about you, but I thought this has been a crazy year and we would probably just ride out the craziness, right? There's enough craziness to kind of last us on into the new year, wouldn't you think? And then lo and behold, we have a Supreme Court justice that dies, and all of the issues that surround that. And here we are, trying to navigate our life in this world, right? And we want to look to Jesus so we know what to do. And, and I affirm that. I, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the book, In His Steps, by, by Charles Sheldon. In His Steps, by Charles Sheldon. Um, what would Jesus do? Remember, some of you are old enough to have the bracelets. Maybe some of you still have bracelets in a drawer somewhere. WWJD. Well, that's from that book. And in this book, um, Edward Norman is an individual. He's a newspaper editor. And he's trying to understand what would Jesus do? That's an older book, and so he's like, do I publish the boxing results? Would Jesus publish boxing results? Would Jesus run this kind of ad? What would Jesus do in life? And I think that we need to be asking ourselves this question, what would Jesus do in our life? Amen? Amen. However, we know that God has a mission for us. And sometimes when we have simply a what would Jesus do mindset, we tend to have this trajectory of our life and our dreams and our goals, and we have our Savior walking kind of right beside us, maybe a half step behind us, and then when we run into an issue, we go, okay, now, now what should I do? Should I do this option or should I do this option? Well, how should I make this decision? And then once we get some advice, we, we just go on our merry way. 
what we really ought to ask ourselves instead of what would Jesus do is what did Jesus do? What was his life about? What was his mission? What were his priorities? Because Jesus tells us time and time again that we are to follow him. And so as we face this chaotic world, sometimes our struggles are because we're simply going about our own dreams and desires, trying to seek God's wisdom on on how we shuffle that without really having our ultimate target be what God wants for us in this life. We are to glorify the Father and to make disciples. That's what we're to do as a church. That's what you're to do as an individual as we trust in Jesus. And so we see this path, right, that Jesus has for us. We are to, we are to come and see a, a challenge to believe in the Lord Jesus. We're to trust him. In fact, we can't make disciples unless we're a disciple ourselves. We need to start with our dependence upon Christ, seeing our need for his salvation, our rescue from sin. The, the hope of everlasting life is only held because we know Christ and we trust in him. And then we start to follow Jesus. We take on his character and his priorities. And then we become fishers of people that we reach out to those that don't yet know Christ and those that do know Christ in order that that these might cross from death to life with the gospel and these might be transformed by the ongoing work of the Spirit and the Word of God to become more and more like Jesus just as we're trying to become more and more like Jesus by the grace of God. And this leads then to a life of fruitfulness where we abide in the vine, enjoying the Father, enjoying the work that he has for us, seeing a legacy of these things happen. That's, in a nutshell, our lives. And so as we think about this, we want to think about what did Jesus do in this world? What were his priorities? How did he go about this task of making disciples. So, we see in John 17 this very interesting interaction. It's God the Son praying to God the Father. And in this we see Jesus' heart. And in some ways, a summary of what has already happened in the book of John and then what's going to happen in the life of not only Jesus in his key hour at the cross, but also beyond as his followers continue to follow him. So turn with me to John chapter 17. The book of John here, it kind of breaks up into several parts. Chapters 1 through 11, we see the seven miracles of Jesus. And then in chapter 12, he focuses in on his disciples in the last week of his life, And the majority from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 17 is Jesus' dialogue with his disciples about what they are to expect, the coming of the Spirit, what's going to happen after he leaves them, and then concluding here in chapter 17 with this prayer that Jesus has to the Father. Chapter 18 and beyond is Jesus' trial, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and then appearance before Jesus his disciples. And so last week we looked at Jesus. He's talking to the Father about himself, and now he's going to begin <clears throat> to pray for those that have been entrusted to him. Today we're going to look at just two simple verses and see what it is that God would have for us. So John 17, verses 6 and 7. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for your insight today. We don't want simply the creative, maybe even seemingly helpful thoughts of people, but we want to know what you think. We want to know what you would have for us. So I pray, O Lord, that it would be your word 
that speaks to us. And we would ask, Lord, that you'd use me or work in spite of me, but that by your Spirit we would truly hear what you have for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Our passage is really simple. The Father gave Jesus disciples and Jesus revealed the Father to them. We see that Jesus' priority here is found in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people. Um, And again, verse 7, they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Jesus came to manifest or reveal or make known the Father to those that the Father has given them. This is uh, the priority of Jesus. We see this in the very beginning. Verse 1.1, one, one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And we see that this is Jesus. And then we go on and we get to see what Jesus' purpose was. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So Jesus came in order to make the Father known. And so we're going to take a look at what does this mean here? What is going on in our passage to make the Father known? And let me just, I want to highlight a few key points. First, we see in this God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the word. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. I know that everything that you've given me is from you. They've kept your word. We see God's sovereign hand. And, and I just want to take a moment here. The world is, is chaotic. It's always been, but it seems especially chaotic now. I mean, can you imagine what next week has in store for us? I mean, really? I mean, I think, I think Mizzou might have a chance to beat Alabama. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we're at in this world. Anything could happen. Who knows what's going to go down? There's going to be something from left field. I mean, things that you could trust, things that you had confidence in, boy, th- those things are going to be stripped away. But we can always trust in the Lord because he is in control. The world is not spinning out of control out of his hands. It seems like the, indeed we are in a storm now. But rest assured that our feet are on a sure foundation. And when Jesus talks about God's mission, he says, you know, indeed, Father, you are in control. We see not only God's sovereignty, we see his love. His love. Look here. I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. You know, in this divine discipleship interaction that we see with Jesus and the Father. What we see is we see God's love, the people that you have given me out of the world. How did did these people, you know, get given out of the world? Was there a, a big competition? Was there a race? No, God, God loves us. Because he loves us. And, and maybe that's hard for us in a world where we have to spend our lives proving ourselves. But here we're reminded once again of the centrality of God's love. I, I took him out of the world and I'm giving him to you. And then we see, again, God's mission. That Jesus manifests the name to the people, and we see that now they, have, they know that everything you have given me is from you. So it's not, verse 7, simply that God would have information conveyed to people via Jesus, but that they would know that whatever God the Son had, it came from God the Father. And so when we talk about manifesting or revealing 
the name of God or the the or God himself, what we really are talking about is not just God and his character and his attributes, but his very mission in this world. It's all bound up, and to truly know it is to trust in it in a way that rescues us. We see this in the previous passage. Just look up here at verse 3. And this is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So, so the question then is what do we do with John 17? Like, this is a prayer, Jesus to the Father. I mean, God the Son is talking to God the Father. It's, it's kind of a Trinitarian mind bender a little bit. Why do we have this? Couldn't Jesus and, and God the Father talk offline? Why do we have this for us? And I think there's a few things. First of all, we want to see the heart of God, see the heart of his mission. But also... Jesus repeatedly tells people to follow me. He says it to Peter and his brothers as they were out there fishing. He says, follow me. He says it to Matthew as he's sitting there collecting tax to follow me. He says it to the guy who's wanting to wait around until his dad dies so he can have this funeral service. He's like, let the dead bury the bed. As for you, follow me. He says it to the rich young ruler. Sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. If any man would deny himself, would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is an expectation that we would follow Jesus. This carries on into uh, after the life of Jesus. Paul says in places like 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Jesus. And oftentimes, I think when we think about our lives and the role Jesus plays, we simply think, well, I got to just trust him. He's going to to do something. He's delivering me from the, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of his beloved son. He's, I get the spirit through him. I have everlasting life and hope and joy. But we don't follow him. We don't look to him to follow him. And I would say this, that if our task is to make disciples, who is the key person we ought to look at on how we ought to do that. It's Jesus, if you're wondering. It's Je Jesus is the answer. It's, you know, great, okay. Jesus. We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus. And that's what I want to do now. We see that Jesus held the priority of revealing the Father. And so what were some of the things that he did as he revealed the Father to his disciples? So that's where we're going to go today. Now, in this, so most of today is going to be the big so what. Like, it's just going to be practical application. Uh, these four keys, um, they're a rough outline of Dan Spader and Sun Life. He's, we've done work with Sun Life before. I did some things with other pastors where we would spend 18 months walking through the Gospels and the life of Jesus, looking at his character and his priorities. What were the things that, that Jesus emphasized? How do we see these play out in the rest of the New Testament? Um, but just to let you know, and if you want additional resources on this, uh, this is fine. But I feel like these are, these are very helpful and quite practical for four keys. If we want to reveal the Father as Jesus revealed the Father, what do we do? How do we do it? Well, first of all, y you be present. <laughs> you show up being present. I find it interesting, uh, places like Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The, the finality of scriptural communication to God, uh, from God to his people is through Christ. And it wasn't just a, a, a message written on stone, uh, but God himself came and delivered that. 
We see this even here in the book of John, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. This idea of, the, of Jesus coming and dwelling among His people. He was present. Uh, Jesus did not take a long traveling tour throughout the globe giving people religious philosophy. He didn't travel much at all. Instead, he was physically present and poured his life into a small group of followers. In fact, when we see after the death of Jesus, there were 120 people praying. That was, in many ways, the sum total of his work that we could see here on earth, but that's what he came to do. He showed up. He was present in their life. We see that Jesus did things with people. People hung out with him. He spent time with his disciples. He was present with them. And let me just say this. It should be incredibly obvious, but maybe not. If you want to be about God's mission, you need to be present with people. I'm a bit of an introvert myself, but I still I need to be present with people. You need to show up. There needs to be access. Sure, there may be some effect. If you sent out a big mailer, maybe an email blast, post something on social media about God. There, there, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that has zero effect, but if we truly want to make disciples, as Jesus made disciples, he was present in their lives. And so, too, we need to be present in people's lives. So I, I, like, I like telling stories from college, because this might be surprising, college was not just a few years ago for me. So, um, I, but I like telling stories about college because I feel like that uh, they probably don't watch this anyway, so it's, it's maybe we're safe. If I start getting emails back, I'll see if I can go back further, and, and I don't know if people from high school mind me telling stories about them. But, but to protect the guilty, we'll call this guy Frank. This is Frank. There's this guy, Frank. And we had a spiritual interest survey from Frank. Interested in Bible study, maybe knowing more about Jesus, but it seemed like Frank was a Christian, and we were a part of a Christian group and wanted to see if he wanted to get involved in a Bible study, be a part of what we're doing there um, on campus. So we go by Frank's room. Frank's not there. But his roommate, Cliff, real name, was there. Hey, is Frank here? No, he's not there. Okay, great. Well, hey, we're doing a Bible study. Just, okay. I did this several times. Always no Frank, but Cliff was there. So we start this Bible. Finally, we get a hold of Frank, and Frank, you know, I remember doing like one thing with him. He maybe came once to the Bible study. And, I mean, his form that he filled out just showed tons of promise. But he just didn't, just didn't show up. But Cliff showed up. He's a follower of Christ. And Cliff was present in other people's lives, which is why he's fruitful for the Lord even to this day. You, you see how that works. I, I think Frank probably had issues with showing up at other things because I don't think he lasted more than a year there at college, but that's neither here nor there. But we need to understand the importance of just showing up. So Ashton singing here, and Ashton plays softball. Ashton's great. If you, any of you guys ever play baseball or softball, it's any sport, right? It's a little bit hard to say, I'm really engaged in what's going on if you don't go to practice or the games. There, there is a simple aspect of showing up that's important. And, and we know that, right? Because now we're into football season and we're seeing college teams that have people, some guys that can't show up because of COVID quarantine or whatever. They're like, we almost can't even play the game if we don't have enough guys show up. You need to show up. And I think for many of us, we're like, oh, I wanna, I wanna do what God wants, but am I gonna, am I gonna be present? Uh, some of you that have ever done kind of investment in other people, maybe help people along in leadership, maybe done some mentoring, but this is especially true even as we talk about discipleship. You 
Look for people that have certain character qualities. They want to be faithful, available, and teachable. I don't know if you've ever heard that acronym, right? It's an AFT, or I think you can organize the word somewhere, some other way if you want. Faithful, available, teachable. It's, <laughs> see, it's kind of funny later. So if someone's available or not available, usually that has to do with their station in life. They can, they can make the choice or not make the choice, or maybe they've made other choices. I, I, I would imagine things like small children or caring for uh, elderly relatives. They take their toll, time-wise, energy-wise. There's, there's maybe less availability for, for those things because God has called you to do some things. So availability, that's kind of where that says. A teachability, that's an issue of the heart. Are you going to be humble or are you going to learn? And if, if you don't want to learn, you're just not teachable. Well, what's the point? Faithfulness is interesting because it's this weird combination of, of willpower and desire um, and skill. Like some people have never learned to be faithful, to show up. They just they kind of, that's a skill that they need to learn. You, you wrangle with willpower and you, you also deal with desire. It's this combination. But if you want to do something for the Lord, you, you, have to, you have to show up. I don't know how else to say that. If you want to think about serving in any capacity, if, if you don't show up, it's super hard. It's, it's kind of step one. Jesus showed up being present. Secondly, it's not only important to be present, but it's also important to spend focused time. So Jesus was spending focused time with his disciples. There is a place for just hang out, get to know each other, to do things. But ladies and gentlemen, we are on a mission. Our time is short. Our lives are not that long. Opportunities come and go. And so we want to be also not only enjoying richly long time uh, with, without any sort of uh, agenda, but we also want to spend focused time where we're really wanting to grow as followers of Christ, be deliberate about our mission. Well, we see that here in the book of John. Um, in chapter 13, it's Jesus is specifically with his 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 12 or 11, I think we lose Judas pretty close to the front, um, for chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's, that's almost 25% of the book. And that doesn't count the other areas of focused time that Jesus spent with his disciples. Jesus spent focused time, deliberate time, Revealing the Father, understanding who the Father is. It takes time. It takes focused time. I remember we, we did this small group once, and initially we started out with one other couple. And we said, you know what? We're not going to do any agenda. We'll just, we'll just kind of hang out. And that'll be the way we go, like, all the way through. And so it sounded great. When you get there, the first time, it was, it was great getting to know them. They were getting to know us. And second time, similar. But about the third time, we're like, okay, this is nice. But what are we doing? <laughs> you know, where is this going? Or by the fourth time, they're like, okay, we got we to gotta get a plan together. All right, we love hanging out just to hang out with you guys. But I think all of us really want to serve the Lord in some specific ways. We want to grow in Christ and we want to help each other. So we need, to, we need to be intentional about that. And from there, the group really flourished. I think that for ourselves as well. That being present is good, but it's not enough. We, we need to spend focused time growing in the Lord and helping others to grow in the Lord. And that's what Christ did. Sure, he ate meals with them. He hung out with them. They, they, all, they all camped or hung out, you know, couch surfed or whatever they did out there. But they, they spent focused time together. Third, um, we need to care deeply about people, but we need to care enough to confront. To care enough to confront. Jesus, Jesus loved his disciples. I mean, he died for them. But he also confronted them when they were believing wrong things. 
It doesn't always have to be an angry confrontation. Uh, in the beginning of John chapter 13, we see Jesus confronting Peter about, you know, how much of Peter needs to be washed. He's like, I don't wash my feet. He's like, if you, I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. He's like, well, then give me a whole bath. And Jesus like, you don't need a whole bath. You just need your feet, right? There's this interaction back and forth between Jesus and, and what needs to happen. And, and so, too, that's what we need to do. We need to care enough to confront. You know why? Uh, there's, we have tremendous obstacles in front of us. None of us I mean, none of us has a bead on who the Lord is in his plan, intuitively. We certainly don't learn it from the world around us. We've got to navigate the Scriptures, the Spirit of God, community of God, as to how we are to do that. It's, it's huge. And you know what? You're going to believe things that aren't true. I believe things that aren't true, and I need correction. I need help. I need to be conformed greater to Christ's image. And sometimes there's a care that comes along where I'm going to help you do that, and I'm going to help others to do that, and we care enough to confront. There are some obstacles, to be honest, not to mention that we live in a world that, I mean, if you were to click on a news website, are, are you going to be like, hey, I learned a lot about the Lord here by reading through this news feed. You know, no one says that. It's just not the way it goes. But more than that, we have some special issues. We struggle when we don't agree. We don't do well, and we're doing worse as a people when we don't agree. Uh, social media has made that hard. It seems like there's growing polarization people, that I'm going to learn all I can in private, do my own individual research, and you either agree with me or, or we're done. And, and how much time do we have to agree with you? I'll kind of just get a sense of your feed and know where you stand on, on, on a few issues, and then I'll, I totally know who you are. And if I like you, I like you, and if I don't, I, I won't have anything to do with you. Life is complicated. What we believe is complicated. Where, where people come from is complicated. There, there's a lot of intricacies. There, there's, there's variations. I mean, maybe some of you fit neatly into a preconceived box, but I imagine most of you don't. I know I don't. But, but if we can't engage with one another and be able to address things that we don't see eye to eye on in a way that, that helps us move towards Christ, that's a real obstacle. Most of the time, it's like, well, if, you're gonna, if you don't agree with everything that I'm doing, then you're done. We're, we're done. I don't want to have, I'm out. Maybe even times without even a word. We, we just walk away. That's the way that we often deal with things. I, I was, it's just, I think it was yesterday or the day before, there's a local news guy that, that I enjoy as a believer, and he retweeted something, and it was this, this guy that said, you know, if my, if my dad doesn't stop whatever politically, he'll never see me or his grandchildren again. I was like, whew. I mean, that's just kind of where we're at as a society. And, and what was more interesting than that, I mean, people say all kinds of ridiculous things online, were the number of comments agreeing with that guy that just said that. I was just like, oh, is this where we're at? So, so there's no hope of change. There's no hope of interaction. There's no hope of understanding. As believers, we need to be different. As believers, we need to be able to, to confront one another and to walk through things. There's another obstacle here with this as well. And that is that if we are revealing the Father, if we're knowing the Father, if we're seeing the, the Father um, be exalted. The idea of Father for many of us is, is at least somewhat skewed, and for some, it's a horrible image that needs to be corrected. So Jesus, when he talks about parents, he, he says this. He's talking about God giving good gifts, and Jesus says, if you who are evil can give good things to your children. So uh, Jesus called every parent evil, by the way, in that statement. He just said, every parent, you're evil. But even, even in your evilness, you can still do good things. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, it, it talks about God being a parent. It says, you know, our earthly fathers, they disciplined us, uh, us as they seem best. They're, we're just trying. You're just trying. And I know some of you, you had great fathers. And, and they, they, they were following the Lord. They wanted to follow the Lord. They, they tried to do good in your life. But for some, fathers that were absent, maybe incredibly selfish and cruel, thought only of themselves. And we need to understand that when we think about God as a father, that that's a hard image. And, and we need to, to be able to confront and process through not our experience, but what the Bible says about our true heavenly father. We need to care enough to confront. Lastly, um, we need to exalt the father in everything. Jesus exalts the father in everything. Uh, we saw that at the end of, of John 18. Uh, we can see it other places. Um, John 5, 19, Jesus goes on like this. He says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Jesus, uh, throughout the Scriptures, is always exalting the Father. He's being led by the Spirit. He's exalting the Father. And I think that's a, a framework for us, too. It, it's not simply that we want to convey information so someone can cross over from death to life. It's, it's not simply that we enjoy the benefits of everlasting life, no more tears, those kinds of things, but that we would see that the Father is worth celebrating. And he's, we want to exalt His name. We want to rejoice in who He is. That, that when we see who the Father is, that that creates joy, and it creates joy in every part of our lives, seeing who God is. That Jesus said, now they know, verse 7, that everything that you have given me is from you. The, the problem with this, you might be going, well, okay, that sounds great. We're here on Sunday morning praising the Father's name. The obstacle, though, is, is that what do we want to glorify and exalt, Right? You know, what has two thumbs and can't get enough attention, right? Isn't that what we do? We, we sit there and go, and even if, if you struggle with issues like of unworthiness, still some weird way we make it about ourselves. Jesus, we see throughout the Scriptures, has models what I would call a healthy self-forgetfulness. He's focused on the Father. He's dependent upon the Spirit. And, and, and that is what we ought to be about. That is, we're revealing the, the Father to others, that we want to exalt the Father in everything, not just to see our great name flourish. Well, as the worship team comes forward, you know, Jesus, he made his life about the Father. And as we make disciples, we want to do the same. And so if you want a disciple like Jesus discipled, we, we need to start with, what do people need? This is eternal life, he says in verse 3, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let's pray. Help us, O Lord. I pray that um, that people in here would first of all trust you because we know that unless we trust you, we can't make others that follow you. But, but for those of us who trust you, Lord, we know that you have a mission for us. Global evangelization that everyone, as it says in, first, uh, in Colossians 1, would be brought to maturity. Lord, that's what we want to see. We want them to know you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us and, and really to others as well. I pray that as we go about this work, we take on the priorities of Christ, being present and focused, caring enough to engage in difficult conversations, and always putting you, Father, above everything. Help us, O oh Lord. May your spirit lead us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.